You are listening to the Hello Sport Podcast. What is up, punters and dribblers? Welcome back to another episode of All Talk with your old pals, Tom and Eddie, from the Hello Sport Podcast. We are here with you on the SEN Airwaves, back for another rip-snorter of an interview with... I'll give you a clue. Have, well, I'll what, give what you clues a clue. are going to be? Well, uh, Harry Arms. All-time... Harry Arms. That's a clue. All-time great captain. Uh, most centuries for Australia ever. Most centuries for Australia ever. Um, still hasn't offered us up a greyhound pooch to purchase. Tasmanian. Tasmanian. You getting it? Um, Am I ringing any bells? Ringing any bells. S- name starts with R. And then last ing. name. Yeah. Nickname. RP. You still nickname, not getting it? Nickname. Might be punter. Punters and dribblers. Yeah. I, I, I'll those. give you a nickname. His nickname is punter or dribbler. Yeah. Uh, and he played cricket. Um, so Any more? If you, well, listen, if you don't want it to, to, to spoil, block your ears now. But he's coming up right now anyway, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> the great, the powerful Ricky Ponting. <laughs> Mate, um, big summer coming up. You must be jam-packed. Yeah, I've been pretty busy already, actually. The, you know, I think I've done four of the five Big Bash games that have been played already. Mm. Um, so flew back into... Melbourne from uh, Launceston this morning and then off to Perth tomorrow for the start of the test series. So Crazy schedule. Your, uh, your, your wife must be very um, forgiving giving the summer, sh- the summer schedule. She must be used to it though now, I guess. Yeah, no, she's, she's used to it. That, that's um, probably where I got lucky that we, when we met, I was obviously on the road a lot and playing a lot. So both her and all the kids sort of only know one way that dad's, a, dad's away a bit of the year. I mean, this year's been... A bit of an exception, really, with you know IPL World Test Championship, Ashes World Cup, all in the same year. It's been a, a lot more time away than normal, but uh, but yeah, it's been fun though as well. There's a part of it where it feels like the cricket calendar generally, and obviously the Ashes is not every single year, but just like it's getting more and more jam packed. Like every year, it seems like we're sort of going like, oh, it's been a busy year, but it almost is becoming the norm. Yeah, that's that's probably that's probably pretty fair. I mean, and it's I mean, it's probably because you're sort of following a lot of the star players around as well, right? A lot of the bigger name players now are playing, you know, more and more tournaments every year. It's not not just the international stuff, but you know, with IPLs popping up and you know, Major League Cricket and all these other big events that are that are happening. The you know, the modern player, um, probably more so, the modern player that's coming towards the end of their inter- international career is playing, you know, probably a lot more than, than ever before. And, and, you know, and we talk about the Aussie boys, but the Indian guys play more than anyone else. I mean, they, they play a serious amount of cricket. So yeah, it's, it's been a big 12 months already for the Aussie, the Aussie guys. As I said, the test summer is about to start. Then they go to New Zealand after that and the IPL rolls around and the T20 world cup straight after that. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, you talk about it being a busy year. Well, it's just, it's just starting. It's almost like a busy life. I remember we spoke to, I think it was Dave, Dave. Warner at the start of the yeah. year, and he was like, oh, you know, we're heading to India, and then I'm not home till November, and, like, all the different things in between. And then, as you say, it's back, and then it's the Australian summer, and then it's New Zealand, and then it's, yeah. like, it is almost like your career starts, and then you're basically on planes until you retire. Exactly right. Yeah, it's pretty much, it's pretty much even when I was playing, it was it was about 11 months of the year out of your own home then. I mean, that's that's 10 or 11 years ago, so... And that was without me playing much, you know, IPL or any of these other um, other other um, tournaments happening around the world. Because even you think about the Australian summer, you know, say say you live in Melbourne like I, I do now, or you live in Sydney, you, you only have the one Test match and probably one one day in your home state for the entire summer. And the summer sort of, you know, middle of November through until mm. you know early March. Um, so you know, through that period, you've only you've only got sort of a week and a half probably in your in your own home. Was it was it difficult being on the road with the boys for that long? Like, was there were there ever moments where you just you had to just go for a nice long walk and just get away from someone? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I mean it is it, it is a long time, you know. And an Ashes tour when I first started, so my, my first Ashes tour in '97 was about four months um, away with a, with a, you know the same group of guys and um, and. You know, it's been well documented maybe over the last few weeks that not everyone sees eye to eye, not everyone sees all the time. Um, but uh, to be honest, I mean, a lot of the teams that I played, you know, I think it was one of the great strengths of those teams was you know, how close the guys were. And, you know, it wasn't – you could have dinner with a different bloke most nights and, and still have a pretty good time. But you still need, you know, you still need your own time. People – 
you know, even with, with me now, you know, in a period like this where I've, you know, been away a lot and travelled a lot, I, I love just to be able to sit at home on a Friday night and be on the couch and not have to worry about, you know, making small talk or or, or talking to people because I, I sort of feels like I spend most of my life sort of doing that, talk, <laughs> talking, and I'm not a great talker at the best of times and, um, you know, my wife and I are pretty private people, so... Um, yeah, I, I do enjoy that time. And whether it's just going for a walk or grabbing the dog, or you know, playing, getting being on the golf course for a, a day a week or whatever, it's important you've got your own time as well. What are you watching on the couch? If I can ask you to share some private information. No, look, I'm. It's it's sport for me. Like everyone asks me all the time, have you have you watched this? Have you watched that? And I'm like, I'm just forever saying no. It's you know, if, if the golf's on or the footy's on or the or the racing channels on, that's uh, that just about does me, mate. So. Um, <laughs> And even with that, I mean, it, that's that's sort of late night stuff as well. By the time you've got, you know, with the, I've got three kids, obviously 15-year-old girl, 12-year-old girl, nine-year-old boy, and by the time we've got them sort of done and away, at, at, you know, at night, because I've been away a lot, then, I, you know, I'll get a few hours to myself on the couch and it's normally just sport time for me. <laughs> Good answer. Yeah. We, um, we've got the first test starting on Thursday. This is coming out the week after the first test will have finished. But just to talk generally about Pakistan coming up, I think I saw something the other day about you. It was, I think it was a quote from yourself about how last time Pakistan came here, you said it was the worst bowling attack to ever tour Australia, but then you retracted that <laughs> and you've sort of applied that. So you've applied that now to this current group of uh, touring Pakistan bowlers. Is that correct? I mean, you, you guys are no better than that. Don't believe everything you read. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who it was. Someone, someone went after me for a couple of weeks there on on Instagram or Twitter or whatever it was because it there was another quote for me attributed to all the millions and billions of dollars that the BCCI are spending on their cricket and changing venues for World Cup and it was there were all these quotes that were just made up for me. <laughs> um, and that Pakistan, that Pakistan bowling attack one was another one. So someone had it in for me, but. Um, yeah, look, look. Actually, I, I actually, I might, I might have said it last time because that attack, they, <laughs> that attack they did bring out here in the last series was, um, yeah, was way below the expectation that you have for a Pakistani fast bowling brigade. You know, that's one thing that they've probably always prided themselves on over the years is is their their quality and their depth of their fast bowling, and it wasn't, it just wasn't on display last time here in Australia. I mean, Afridi was here last time, but they had a young. Nassim Shah just making his debut on that in that series, and the other guys they brought were, um, you know, what I felt at that stage, well below um, test quality and test standard. But and it, look, it, the disappointing thing I think for Pakistan in this series is Harris Ralph not being there. You know, deciding to pull himself out of that this tour to to play in the Big Bash is it's great for the Big Bash, but it doesn't doesn't send a great message to. Uh, to Pakistan or to world uh, to world Test cricket, to be honest, that one of your star players um, chooses is a domestic comp over representing your country. Is there an element with that where you've kind of got Australian cricket like uh, cannibalising its own product a little bit, where you've got like the Big Bash taking a player out of the summer? Like, is there something there where you should be where there should be something in place to stop that from happening, or is it sort of you can't help it? Yeah, I mean, it's been to be totally honest, it's been the one negative against the Big Bash from its inception is that we don't get to, it, you know, the the internationals we don't get to see the our best Australian players playing in the Big Bash because they run simul, you know, simultaneous alongside the you know the Australian Test summer. So, you know, for the Big Bash to ever perform it at its optimum and be the best it could ever be, you, you want to see as many of the Australian players playing in that comp. And you know, we saw evidence of that last year at the end of the. Uh, the test summer last year when you know guys like Steve Smith could come back into the big bash you know what what impact that had on the tournament crowds at the ground went up you know viewing viewership at home went up uh, and the tournament all of a sudden got a bit of a buzz back around it again because the the best Australian players were playing so um yeah I guess you know I mean you don't you don't want to see that but it, you know it's probably a a bit of a reflection on on the modern game more than anything you know with the amount of money that's around now in these domestic comps um and I've said it for years, you know, I'm I'm really worried about the West Indies with their cricket and, um, you know, some of these other smaller countries where their, their national contracts, um, you know, are probably a tenth, maybe 10% of what they can make, um, when you know, for an IPL contract or something like that. So it, it's it become, when you're a professional player, you've got such a short 
um, lifespan in the game, you can understand why some of these players are making those decisions. Yeah, for sure. 100%. I, yeah, obviously, they've moved uh, the start of the test summer because of the World Cup, which then, I guess, even exasperates exasper, exacerbates sorry, the issue around uh, test player eligibility for the Big Bash. In a perfect world, where would you be putting the Big Bash so that we can see the throbbers of Australian cricket playing test and Big Bash? Like, do you, yeah, you is, know, is there an yeah. answer? Um, there's probably not. I mean, I, I yeah, you know, it's, it's easy to say to play the whole thing before the Australian summer, you know, but then you, you're sort of dealing with weather. And like, let's say you looked at September, October, something like that, try and get it done then. But generally, the Australian team will be um, overseas at that stage anyway, um, playing another tournament somewhere. So it's hard to get the Australians in there. You say at the end of the summer, you know, you can't have it really at the, at the end of the summer because that sort of rolls into an IPL period as well when a lot of the Australian players will be wanting to go and play over there. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it, I'm not sure what the right answer is. I think what they've tried to be able to do this year is, and what they'll continue to do is just condense the tournament down a little bit. You know, it's gone from 14 games the last couple of years down to 10 games this year, which, you know, makes it more attractive for overseas players to come as well because they feel like they're not, you know, they're not missing bigger chunks of other tournaments and they're also not, you know, in Australia um, for, for, for too long. I mean, it's not saying there's anything wrong with being in Australia for too long, but <laughs> through, through that time of year. But I know that that's been one of the negatives from some of the better international players coming to Australia has just been the length of the Big Bash. But they've, they've, they've turned that around this year, which I think... It will be good, and it, the other thing, by shortening it, means that you know the finals of the BBL this year are actually in the school holiday period, which is where you know, and then you can let the kids go and enjoy um, the best of the best in the Big Bash. Mm. Do you like the fact that there's going to be more tests in January? Like, is that a do you think that's good, or do you prefer? I just we were discussing before we before we jumped on here. Like, I'd sort of forgotten that we usually would have had a test by now that's Couple. already been played. At least, do you? But I haven't found myself uh too put out by that and that could obviously be for the world cup but like how do you see the way it's gone this year uh, generally um well it's it's been fine for me because i as a, I've, i was actually away in india for that for that month for the back half of the of the world cup and then you know only home for a sort of a week and a half and then i'm rolling straight into the big bash so it's for me personally this year it's, it's worked fine um and it's it's a one off year as well. This one with um, with the with the World Cup just having been where it, where, where it was, and um, I think next summer we've got India in Australia, which will be five tests. So, I, so I'm, I'm against India, so I reckon that'll probably roll back into the the normal sort of starting time, which would be sort of late November. Get a couple of games in before the Boxing Day test, and then finish in Sydney like we historically and traditionally have. So um, I found it okay this year, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I, the traditionalists will be the, the ones probably to ask more about how they have felt around the summer. Punters and Dribblers, we are brought to you as always by our good friends at Ned's, the number one betting platform on the face of God's green earth. Now, if you followed me on Ned's profiles, which you should be, about 1,700 followers, I think, at the moment, you would know that I got on a horse by the name of my boy Birmingham on the weekend at $39, and she saluted. Now, it's obviously a boy, probably. It's called My Boy Birmingham, so he saluted. You would imagine it's a boy? Can't be sure, though, can you? No, you can't. Probably likely a gelding over a stallion, mm. but again, can't be sure. Can't be sure. But if you were following me on profiles, you would have seen that the man was... Look, I didn't come up with it. I got, I got, it got alerted to me, but at 39s, that's my biggest... That's my longest donkey ever. Not not a bad bet to have in the profile. Yeah. A thirty nine dollar salute. Yeah. Makes you look like a bit of a big dick. Yeah. When you're not. When you're not. Exactly right. I'm a little bit jealous, if I'm mm. gonna be honest. Yeah. About the ability to pretend like my penis is bigger than it is. Yeah. Very few opportunities present itself for me to do that, yeah. Tom. Thirty nine dollar do with your name on it. My boy Birmingham would have been one of those things. Now, if it wasn't for the fact that I was getting the house ready for a do, mm. I would have been on profile, seen you do it, and then I would have put my own on. If I was in the about even group, let's say, passcode dribbler, if I'd seen you put that bet on, I would have followed you. Yep. Unfortunately, I was busy preparing for a, a good friend's engagement yep. drinks. But if you don't have that excuse, and most of you won't, then you have no excuses if you weren't following Tom along on the Ned's profiles. If you did, you'd have $39 reduced times whatever you put on it in your fucking back pocket. Thank you very much to Ned's. 
And if you do not follow us yet, you're an idiot. Make smarter decisions. And if you're not in the group, again, see above. Imagine what you could be buying instead. For free and confidential support, call the number on screen or visit the website. There's been a lot said in the media around uh, Mitch Johnson's comments in regards to David Warner's um, retirement, his, his uh, pen, impending retirement. Uh, and he was sort of of the opinion that he hasn't warranted selection and in so facto hasn't warranted a swung song sort of uh, test series, so to speak. Like, where do you, how do you sort of feel about ex players going that hard in the paint? Um, Soundbite time, Ricky. Soundbite. We're going to clip this up. This thing's going to go. Well, this is going to make world in, regards, games. in regards to people they played, you know, a fair bit yeah. of cricket with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I've um, I'm, I've been asked this a lot over the last couple of weeks. You know, having been on TV most nights and and trying to promote the game and and the BBL like I have. Um, you know, I think what Mitch, I think Mitch, some of the things Mitch had to say had a lot of merit. Um, you know, it's it, you know David hasn't set the world on fire as far as Test cricket is concerned for the last few years. And if you have a a really deep dive into the stats, the stats will back that up. But there's a uh, there's a way you can get those messages across as well without probably going to the point of saying some of the things that Mitch had to say. And um, and at the, at the end of the day as well, Dave, I think David's David is hoping and wishing to be able to have that fairy tale ending in in Sydney. I don't think it's I don't think it's guaranteed and he's been told that that's definitely going to happen. I think the ball, you know, the ball ends up being in his court now as to how well he plays in the first couple of test matches. You know, he, there was talk, and and remember when this all stemmed back, this stemmed back to his selection in the Ashes squad, um, you know, in the middle, in the middle of the year. Um, and, you know, it, it, you know, with Candace working in the media as well, she got sort of put on the spot, and um, you know, so that, it, it just all turned into something that it probably shouldn't have turned into. And you know, I, as I said the other day, it, it probably could have been. Well, I know for a fact that that Mitch reached out to Davy. I think tried to call him and try to have a, a chat when this initially started, and that didn't happen. And if, I think if that had have happened then, then you know, a lot of this might have been put to bed. I think the, the guys would have been able to sort out the differences that they had, rather, you know face-to-face or over a phone call rather than trying to do it um, in the media, which is not good for anybody. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's probably – that's how I would sort of sum up what, what's happened over the last few weeks. It's funny. So the friends of the show that you also know, the great cricketer, I was listening to them uh, yesterday and they actually just brought up something which had just sort of – I guess so I didn't remember exactly how David phrased it back when he was speaking about ideally wanting to finish in Sydney – the way his whole like the language around it all was not like I'm gonna retire and Sydney. It was like if I'm playing well, if I'm scoring runs, like it was far less right. presumptuous mm. than I think we all now just think it was. It was actually like yeah. his words were very much like if I'm playing well, if I'm scoring runs, then that would be a nice way to do it. So it's it's funny the way that it's now sort of that we all perceive it. Do you are you hyper aware of the way you or of what you say when you're trying to hand out critiques of players? Uh, are generally, but I guess specifically ones that maybe you played with or that you know that you've got a close relationship with, like, because I guess that the Mitchell Johnson one is an example of someone maybe just going a little too hard. Yeah, but I mean that that he ended up going as hard as he did because of the personal nature from where it started before. So mm-hmm. there was some personal stuff on the back of what happened in I don't even know when that Test squad was picked. Um, would have been. May or June, somewhere, wouldn't it, before the guys went away to the ashes? So it sort of stems back that far, and the issues weren't dealt with then. So this has been simmering along and bubbling along. And, you know, when Mitch got an opportunity to be able to say something and almost retaliate in a certain way, mm. um, that that's 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 what happened. But yeah, look, I am I am very aware because you know, I'm I'm commentating on a lot of good mates, a lot of guys that I've played with, a lot of guys that I've now coached, whether it be in the IPL or I've, I've worked with the Australian team in a couple of big tournaments as well. And you know, one day you're working with them, the next day you're sitting up in the commentary box having to critique the way that they're playing or the way you think they're going about their cricket, and it's not it's not easy. You know, and I, you know, and a, the one that I'll bring up is you know with with Marcus Stoinis at the back end of the World Cup. You know, I'm sitting in the commentary box in India, and um, you know there was talk around um, who Australia will go with uh, in the you know the back end of the tournament. Whether will it be Marnus Labuschagne or will it be Marcus Stoinis? And Ian Bishop sort of put me on the spot and said. You know, what would you do? Who would you pick? And I, I've been sort of watching and, and obviously I watch the game very closely and I've, I've been, 
um, looking at how the Australian players, how the captain and coach were using certain players in that side. And I sort of said, because I, I whenever I make a judgment, I, I want to be, I want to do it like that, it, that it makes like, I, I think I'm going to be right with what I say. Right. Yeah. So he asked me that question and and I said, well, I think, you know, the way it's going, I think that they'll pick Labuschagne, you know, ahead of Stoinis. And Stoinis and Marcus is one of my best mates. Yeah. Um, out, out of the game of cricket, we talk regularly and talk about all things cricket and all things life. And I was put on the spot and asked that question. And and because I felt that they w- would actually go ahead and pick Marcus, I said that. So it made my, you know, made me look like I had the, the right idea of what was going on in the game. And then... And then when you go and interact with the team a couple of days later, you can feel the boys, the, the players know when you've right. said something, and you get you get that bit of a a feeling from them. Um, and it's awkward, but at the same time, I've got a, you know I've got a job to do, and I want to you know I want to be making sure that I'm doing the best job that I can do. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, I, you know you, you are going to upset people, but I think if you you find the right way to get your message across, you know it doesn't have to be out and out personal stuff. You can you can be you can be on the money and be um, correct and smart, and and still do it in a in a way that doesn't offend. Yeah, you um talking about being right in terms of things you're calling for, and like there's a couple of there was a couple of moments during the World Cup, specifically one that comes to mind. But I remember thinking it a few times, hearing you in commentary, where you uh, whenever Travis Head took those two wickets, and you were just like, you're like, oh, I wouldn't mind seeing them bring on Travis Head at some point here, or there's something to that effect. And then within like five minutes, they've brought him on and he takes two wickets. Are you sort of like sitting up there, like, you know, quietly fist pumping? Is it hard not to almost pat yourself on the back mid commentary being like, called it? Oh, I wish there was a, I wish there was a camera on me at the time. Yeah. Cause I, <laughs> yeah, well, I actually called it. I think it was, was, I think he bowled the next over after yeah. I called it. I think was beside me. I think the over before that, I'd sort of tapped him on the leg. Cause the thing when you're working with someone like Finchie as well, both being captains, we're, we're looking at the game when we're commentating it like a captain would look at the game. Mm. So I, I tapped him on the leg the over before and said, mate, you know what, I, it's time for Travis. Like they're, they're not playing Maxi well, um, the two batters. Um, and it was, it was, it was Klaassen and David Miller, I reckon it was, David Miller in the, in the semifinal. And they they weren't playing Maxwell well and they were, and they were playing Zampa really well and scoring heavily off him. And I thought, well, the other right arm off spinner they've got in the side is, is Travis. Mm. Um, so I tapped Finch on the leg and said, look, Nick, I'm, I'm actually going to call this next over. So I said, right, it's time for get, to get Travis into the attack. And I backed it up with, you know, we know what it's like, Finch, you know, when they bring a more part-time bowler on, you can just relax a little bit and not concentrate as much as you need to. And quite often that can be the little, the little break in concentration that leads to a wicket. I think he... Class and pulled him for full first ball, and then missed a straight one second ball that went on and cannoned into the stumps, and and then big um, Marco Jansen came out and <laughs> Trav hit him on the pad first ball, and he had, he had two wickets in his first three balls. <laughs> and I, you know, as I said, but, it, it, but that's where you need the camera, right? Because I was sitting back in the seat, like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, having having finally got one right. Nice, you um, you've obviously spent a fair bit of time with the boys. You say you've worked with them, you, you know them well. Obviously, the start of the World Cup was, was you know, panic stations in a big way. Were you surprised with the way they were able to turn that around and then obviously go on to win the damn thing? Like, was that a shock to you or, or knowing them as well as you know them, were you, were you confident that they could do that? I was actually more shocked the way they started. <laughs> I, I, wasn't surprised that, I wasn't surprised that they made it to the semifinals and won because I actually tipped, it, I actually tipped that final. I tipped Australia-India final before the World Cup started. Um but when I watched them play their first two games, um, that yeah, I was I was shocked at how badly how badly they they had played, mm. um, and it was it wasn't ju- it wasn't just that it was you know they'd been to South Africa as well they won the first two games there they lost the last three they then had that series against India where things didn't really go to plan <laughs> they had a few injuries they were sort of um, mixing their batting order around here and there you know Cummins wasn't hadn't been there um, Steve Smith hadn't been there so there were lots of things that were sort of going on around that group where it, it sort of felt like it was a a, a bit um, un- unorganised is not the right word, but they just hadn't been able to get all all their ducks in a row, I guess, um, coming into the World Cup. And then they started sloppily. And, you know, the, the, the one thing that I think all of us that have played a fair bit of cricket for Australia identify quickly is when Australian teams aren't fielding well, mm-hmm. then that's generally a bad sign because it's always one thing Australia have prided themselves on. And I've never seen a... I've never ever seen a, a, a champion cricket team that's not a great fielding team. And 
you know, Australia at the start of that World Cup were particularly sloppy in the field. And, and you know, I think, and they'll say it, they they actually felt really like quite, quite tired in, after the first couple of games, having having done the amount, the amount of travel they had, having played in South Africa and India be, immediately before the World Cup. Um, and I think it just took those couple of losses. And let, let, let's remember the... The third game they played as well against having lost the first two games, Sri Lanka was something like one for 160 as well at the start of that game. Mm, <laughs> that yeah. Well, that could have well and truly got out of hand and that might have been World Cup over. But so, look, I was surprised how they started, but I had a feeling, you know, I, I, had a, I, I, I knew they'd beat South Africa in the final, uh, in the semi final, and I just had a feeling about them in the final as well. And because um, I, it, there's two things that happen in those finals Australian, Australian teams definitely raise themselves to another level in those big games. And I think other teams think that Australian teams are going to play at a level higher than they have and therefore try and elevate themselves mm. and can't do it to the level that Australia can. And I think that's probably – I think India outthought themselves in the final um, with the wicket preparation the way it was and, and certainly the way they handled their bowlers at the start of their bowling innings. Um, so I think Australia handled the, the situation better than India. We just, as a nation, have an insatiable appetite for World Cups, though, don't we? It's, we do. it's, it's ridiculous how well we are, how, like how much better we are than the rest of the planet. And we rise. And we rise to the occasion. But it just, I mean, it was a shock, though. Even like, you, it was a shock and it reminded me to never doubt that we're going to win the World Cup. <laughs> just always assume we're going to win it. Never bet against Australia, mate. No. Um, so back to the summer of cricket here in Australia and just quickly back to, not to the Warner saga, but just the fact that he is obviously coming, he is time in the saddle, as it were, is uh, coming to an end. There's so many different uh, potential replacements for him. People, are, and, uh, you know, there's the, your Bancrofts, uh, Marcus Harris, Mitch Marsh, I heard Cam Green was even thrown in there at one point. Um, I guess, w what are your thoughts around this? Um, and, and then also, uh, Will Pekowski, where's he at? Well, there's a, yeah, there's a few good questions sort of thrown up in that. I'm um, I'm not in the juggling the batting order around to try and find a spot for someone. Um, yeah. You know, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, Marnus potentially going up and opening the batting so Green can come in and slot in at number four. You know, there's been talk about Mitchell Marsh going up and opening the batting so Green can come back into that number six slot. Um, I just think it's time that we learn more about some of these openers. I mean, I, Marcus Harris has had a pretty good run at it, 20 odd tests or whatever it is for him at an average of, you know, maybe 20, around 20. Um, Matt Renshaw is the other name that sort of been Renshaw, in there. Yeah. He's been the spare batter. He got 100, obviously, in that Prime Minister's 11 game as well. So it puts his name back up again. But uh, I, I, I'm, I, I actually feel that they that Bancroft is the one that's done enough um, most recently to get to get, to get crack at it. Is it? He's an opening batsman where the other guys aren't. Um, I think he deserves that that chance um, to to have another crack at opening the batting in, in Test cricket. And what that unfortunately means. And so I'll back that up with some other ideas ar around the reasons why. Labuschagne's probably been the best number four number three batsman in world cricket for the last two or three years. So why move him? Mm -hmm. Steve Smith's record speaks for itself at number four. So why would you move him up to three if Labuschagne goes up? Um, a lot of the success that this Australian team has had has been based around Labuschagne and Smith's partnerships at three and four. Travis Head's emergence at number five has been pretty uh, incredible. And Mitchell Marsh back in the team at number six, um, we, we, we know what he can do. So I'm not moving any of those guys if there's someone that's, um, you know, that's good enough to open. And I think Bancroft uh, is, is a better player now than he was when he went out of the side. And I think he deserves uh, the, the next crack. Where which, you... which, sorry, which, sorry, unfortunately means that the Cameron Green, you know, as highly talented as he is, might just have to sit back and and wait his turn for a while. Which, you know, we've all been there. I, you know, I was dropped as much as anybody early in my career, and um, you know, every time you get dropped, I'm, I'm, I guarantee you'll come back a better and stronger person and stronger player. And that might just mean that's what, what's going to happen with Cameron Green. When you uh, reflect on David Warner's career, as Tom said, it's obviously coming to, the, to an end uh, in the next couple of tests. Where do you sort of see him fitting into uh, the makeup of great Australian players and great Australian batsmen? Sort of, where do you sort of see him fitting into that tapestry? Oh, well, I think he's, he's one of our. Well, it's probably hard to argue that he's probably our best um, all-format player. You know, if you if you combine T Twenty One days and tests over the longevity of his career, it's probably hard to find anyone um, that's had the same success as he has across 
the formats, you know, and you look at his one day career um, in isolation, his, his World Cup record in itself is, is outstanding. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he'll be he'll be thought about and talked about right up there with the very best openers in across all formats that, that Australia's produced for sure. His World Cup record is uh, outrageous, isn't it? Yeah. He was going for it. Um, where are we? So uh, I wanted to get an update on Ponting Wines. Where is it at? Because the last time, I don't know if you remember, we had a waiter in here, our producer Dave. He was in a tux. He was bringing us wines, sampling all of the goodies. Uh, it's a little too early in the day probably for us to be able to get stuck in, but yeah. Ponting Wines Never obviously best in class. How's it all going? Yeah, no, look – don't, don't say it's ever too early for a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when it's when you're in the busy, middle of a busy summer, you've got a couple of hours at home by yourself in the <laughs> afternoon. It, it mightn't be too far away for me to Savo. Once That's I go and get point. the young bloke, we go and pick the young bloke up from his cricket camp. Then it might be time to to knock the top off a bottle. But no, look, it's um, we it, it must be a couple of years now since we've spoken. So we yes. um, we we're, we're almost four years into this little startup business of ours now, and um. And, and look, it's been so much fun. It's not easy, I can tell you. Starting up a, a new business and in you know the current sort of economic times is not an easy thing to do. Um, and when you're sort of entering such a big industry as the Australian wine industry, it's you know it's it's competitive and it's hard work. And and I think Rihanna and I have sort of realised that it's you know it, it, you you have to be working hard on this business twenty four seven to keep making. Um, good solid roads and good impact into the into the market and um, but so that and that's been a learning curve for us. I mean, the business is chugging along really nicely. We still need to get a bit more exposure. You know, we need to keep pushing the brand out there more. You know, one of the biggest things we've we've actually found, and I probably said this to you guys a couple of years ago, is people still probably don't they see the name on the bottle, but still probably don't really understand that it's that it's our business. You know, mm. because there've been other been other. I don't want to say I'm a celebrity, but with celebrity brands out there in the past that sort of haven't been that you know people have put their name on a bottle and not actually owned the business where for us this is you know this is our business we own the majority Rihanna and I own the majority of the business and uh, are working on a daily basis basis to make the business the best that it can possibly be so look we've got some really really interesting and exciting things happening at the moment a bit of export into the UK and India and a few other countries as well which has been um you know, once again, hard work to establish, but once those things are up and running really well, then that you know that'll be a, a nice little extra arm to the business. But you know, we're still we're still working on a daily basis to to get every everything right domestically um, as far as retail and distribution is concerned. But um, you know, you know, you guys worked your way through a bit of the range last time, and we did, and, yeah, we did, and yeah. Um, yeah, we I think we've got eleven, we've got eleven wines in the range now, sort of across Tasmania and South Australia, and. Um, look, we're ultra proud of what we've been able to achieve in a short time. And as I said, with a bit more hard work and, and promotion and people talking about the brand and, and, and sampling the wines, then we know that it can grow and grow pretty quickly. It looks obviously very nice, the bottle and all the, the different sort of um, – I've lost my words as to how – Narratives. Was, narratives, stories. stories and, the, and you're saying, you know, that sometimes people don't attribute that it's actually your wine. Have you ever just thought of sticking your face on there, just like a big sticker, removing all those nice <laughs> – and mate, oh, it's hard enough, to sell it, hard enough to sell it with the name on it, let alone putting my <laughs> dial on the, on the bottom. I mean, even to back up what you're saying there, like we've done, you know, wine shows all over Australia the last three or four years. And even in my home state, I go down to Tassie and do a wine show in Launceston and a wine show in Hobart. And I'm standing there behind the stall, you know, pouring wines out to people. And they'll actually walk up and say, oh, is it, what, what are you doing here? Is this, it is actually yours. <laughs> and I'm like, um, yeah, if there was one place in the world I thought people might understand it, it might have been Tassie, but. Um, so there, that's some of the challenges that you face. But um, no, look, if we got to the, if we got to the point of putting anyone's face on it, I think I'd probably sell more if I put Rihanna's face on it than mine. <laughs> <laughs> How's it been going in India? Do you do you find you um, are they a wine drinking nation? Obviously, parts of it is is Muslim or they, they're sort of alcohol free. But is that do you sort of see that as a as a big as Ponting wines having a big future over there? Yeah, well, it's one thing that was actually overlooked with the, the World Cup scheduling. It hasn't been talked about enough. Like, if, if you want to beat Australia in a World Cup final, you're going to play it in a dry state, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, World Cup final was, the World Cup final was played in Ahmedabad, Gujarat, which is a dry state. So the Aussie boys couldn't have a beer leading into the final. Yeah. That's sort of, <laughs> and I, but, yeah, um, they might have found a way to have a couple after the final. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But yeah, in in India, it's the same. It's the same thing. Like it's um. But the 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 thing there, the size of the market is astronomical. So mm. you know, historically, Indians um are bigger Scotch whiskey drinkers than anything else. Um, you know, I think wines only. Well, well I know wines only about one percent of the um, alcohol cons- consumption in India. But when you look at what that one percent is, it's actually it's a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we've got to we've got to find a way to break in and be a, a as big a part of that one percent as we possibly can. But you know the culture culture changing is changing a lot um, in India. I think more Westerners are probably you know traveling to that part of the world now than ever before. You know the hotel chains now are you know you got six star hotels and probably you know six or ten of them in every in every state in India, which will obviously have high class restaurants and and things, which is where you can sort of start to get your wine in uh, to those places. But I, so I've had some great help from uh, my owners at the Delhi Capitals, actually, that own the own the Delhi um, International Airport, and obviously with international airports become come duty free shops, and that's where we sort of launched oh, nice. in, the, in the in the duty free area in, in in Delhi. So that's that's where we sort of started things off, and you know once once again once we get the distribution right over there, and we can start sort of breaking into that market and get some recognition, then um, you know that hopefully the, the skies are limiting that part of the world for us. Have you always been uh, like business minded? So even as a player, and you know, once you start, you come into money and sort of like you know working out ways to to invest or what to do. Has it always been something that's interested you when you were younger, or is it something that sort of developed over time? No, it's definitely developed. I mean, when when I was a young bloke, I was so single minded on just being the best cricketer that I could, and you know, and and. and but as as your life goes on, and you know things start to change, and you you know you meet someone, you settle down, you start about family, you got to start thinking about things in a different way, and you know you know then you end up with a manager and or a management company who then then it's their job to look after a lot of that stuff, you know your business sort of side of things, and and let let us as cricketers or athletes get on with worrying about what we have to worry about, which is at the end of the day getting out there and, and making runs or taking wickets, so. It's only been, you know, I've been retired 10 years now. I've always had, you know, investments and things along the way. And Rana and I's other focus when I was playing was our was our charity foundation, which took up a lot of our work. So that was sort of, you know, we were raising a lot of money there for, for you know, sick young Australian kids battling cancer. And um, that was what most of our focus is on um, and, and still is. But, you know, now that I'm, I'm retired, we've got a bit more time to focus on some of our other business interests and we're both wine uh, yeah, avid wine drinkers and and have enjoy, enjoyed that journey down the the wine track that we've we've come along and yes. have you oh sorry just to follow up have you had like um i imagine but if there are any that come to mind like absurd like your manager comes to you with like hey this person wants you to be the face of i literally just stole my question <laughs> 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 Um, I'm pretty well protected by my management. Um, <laughs> I've been with James uh, for a long time and he's one of those guys, well, he knows me inside out and he knows the things that he can bothers coming to me with and the things he doesn't bother coming to me with. And <laughs> I'm sure there would have been some absolutely absurd ones over the, over the year. Off, off the top of my head, um, uh, no, look, I, I can't even think of one that, that that it, that that is as I said, I think he's he's shielded me the most. It's good management. That is good it's management. good management because there would have been some absolute shockers. I reckon. <laughs> yeah. How um how are the dogs running, mate? Well, that, I think the last time I was on, I was promised you guys I might have been able to get us one. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. 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 We're, we're we're waiting. We're waiting. We're very patient. But yeah, well, look, look, to be honest, I didn't want to let you down. I haven't had too many fast ones of late, so I didn't want I didn't want to let you down with with um with one that was was too slow. So I've only <laughs> to, to be honest, I've only got. I've only got four or five racing at the moment, but as we, you know, the, the litters of pups come around um, reasonably quickly. Uh, so um, we'll be breeding again soon, and I'll uh, I'll make sure I keep you boys in mind. Please keep us in mind. We uh, this is like it, this is not a joke. We are one hundred percent down. If there's any way we can find ourselves uh, a pup, a pooch, yeah. fast, fast. Look, fast is fast to be great. <laughs> fast is idea. in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, exactly. You know? It can look fast. <laughs> yeah. Even if it looks fast. Well, look, look, they're, they're all fast. If you, go and st- if you go and stand beside them, you're chasing, they're all fast until you get them in a field <laughs> with seven others and there's seven others that are faster than yours, then that's not much fun. Trust me. <laughs> no. Well, we might just have to take it down the grades. You know what I mean? Start at the very bottom. Yeah, work our way up. Like Geary Racing or something, you know what I mean? <laughs> something yeah. really slow. Yeah, happy with that. Uh, um, I, I, I wouldn't do that to you. Oh, oh well, thank you. But anyway, yeah, mate, yeah, keep us in mind, um, and we'll be, we'll just be, you know, we'll be waiting. Yeah, yeah, we'll absolutely. be patiently waiting. 
A um, couple more things before we let you go. I understand you've got uh, a busy schedule, but um, Alyssa Healy recently has taken over as the captain of the women's side. Um, it seems like sort of the natural, the, the natural choice there. How do you see how that's unfolded? Yeah, that, uh, awesome. Um, really happy for Alyssa. I mean, she's done it when she's had a chance to captain in the past. She's done a she's done a really good job. Um, very experienced player. You know, on top of her own game, which is, I mean, they're, they're the important things that when you're looking at leadership, you know, you've, you've got to have someone that, that you know, is playing well and can handle the big pressure moments. And, mm. you know, some of the things that she's been able to do in, in Ashes series or in World Cup finals or whatever, you know, says that she's going to stand up under the most pressure. Um, I know they've, they've got a test coming up in India, I think. She's actually... Um, yeah, that she that she'll be she'll be leading over there. So um, yeah, and, and if she needs any advice, I'm sure Mitch is going to be pretty happy. Mitch Stark's going to be pretty happy to pass on some <laughs> advice to her if she needs any. But um, I feel like that advice should be coming the other way, right? Like in, you're looking at her career. I mean, she seems like the one that needs to be passing on to Mitch. Certainly from a captaincy perspective as well, right? Yeah, wasn't there wasn't there a famous quote of, of maybe a year ago about the Stark family or Stark Healy family? How Mitch might have been the worst performer out of all three of them. <laughs> <laughs> His, so brother, his brother being his brother being an Olympian or a Commonwealth Games medalist and Alyssa doing what she was doing and Starkey was sort of stuck somewhere in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I'm not sure how well that went down with the big fella. But. No, I'm sure. I'm sure that didn't go down too well. I think it would have gone down like a lead balloon, to be yeah. honest. Um yeah. Will Pekoski, I mentioned before, just oh, because yeah, there'd yeah. been there'd been yeah. all of the chat around, you know, he's obviously been he's obviously been in conversations every year around opening and he's obviously had the well documented um sort of concussion issues, but just hadn't heard anything given the nature of the opening conversations this year. Yeah, well, he's been back playing. He's been back playing for Victoria this this season. Um, uh, and I'm not sure if he's played every Shield game. I, I'm pretty sure he might have missed one, um, but he's been back at the top of the order. Hasn't set the world on fire with the bat. I don't think he's made 100 this year yet, but he made a couple of promising starts. But I think the thing with Will, you know, and I'm just speaking as an absolute cricket fan, and, you know, I've had a little bit to do with him through his journey, everyone just wishes and hopes that he can get back to where he was, you know, get back to um, opening the batting for Australia again, but more more importantly, get back to being in, in really good um, health, you know, and not have these ongoing issues that he's had for the last four or five years now, you know, these concussion-related um, incidents that he's had. So I think that's the, the, the wish of everybody because I think when we saw him on test debut, I think we saw that, there was a there was a proper cricketer there that was just sort of waiting to explode on the world stage and and we haven't seen enough of that just yet so we all go to bed at night with our fingers crossed and hoping that we'll wake up the next day and we see Pukowski out there making runs for Victoria is he a victim of sort of a, a, a modern um, sort of insistence on taking head knocks really really seriously or is He's sort of just like an anomaly in the in the fact that he's just had so many concussions, and off the back of that, he's had some some concussion related illnesses, like you've mentioned. Was that sort of thing as common in your day, or is is that sort of are we seeing more of that now with a focus on concussions? Uh, we're seeing more of it. There's no doubt about about because there's more awareness of it, right? It's like all these things in society now. We're seeing more of them because everyone's talking about them and and happy to talk about them. Where you know, 20 years ago. You know, it was weak to come out and talk about getting hit in the head or, or having some, you know, issues of getting hit in the head. You know, I mean, it, and it's all heating up big time in the AFL. You know, I'm sure the rugby league's been the same. American sports are probably the leaders in all of it. Um, so, yeah, and but he, as far as cricket's concerned, he's very much an outlier. You know, his, his first real concussion was an, an Aussie rules concussion, I think, as a 15 or 16-year-old at um, in senior school. And I think... As the story goes, he missed months of school. That's how bad his first ever concussion right, was. Okay. It might have been, it might have been four, five, or six months he missed of oh, school. Wow. And, wow. Okay. Um. So it was a serious one, and then you know, he, and unfortunately for him, he's he's copped and you know enough blows along the way through his career career that, and I'm sure it's you know, and I don't know much uh, enough about it, so I shouldn't be talking too much about it. But I, but you know, from what I gather, every little knock you get, um. You know, it just uh, sort of compounds the on top of itself and gets worse and worse along the way. But that's that's where I say we we just we just hope and as and and keep our fingers crossed that those days are somehow behind him and mm. um, he can get a good run at it again. Definitely. Um, now, again, timing, but uh, time being of the essence here, we are where we've been talking about you know classic catches. Obviously, summer. That's what it's all about. 
um, and you're seeing all the footage every this time of year comes up. Do you have a catch that you deem as either your greatest catch of all time or just maybe the greatest you've ever seen? Um, geez, uh, there's there's been a lot there's been a lot of great catches, um, and I was I was reminded of one last night actually, and I'm not sure if you guys can remember this, but Jordan Silk. Uh, who plays for the Sydney Sixers, took one at yeah. mid on at the Gabba. Um, I'd just been building yes. him up and talking about how good a fieldsman he was. He's the best fieldsman in the country. And he took one on the circle at mid on, one that was absolutely creamed. I think Craig Keyswetter was the batter, an overseas English, Englishman. Um, full stretch to his left, it took about three or four steps and dived to his non preferred hand and, and took a an absolute screamer. I mean, some of the ones you're seeing on the boundary line now. They've got to come into those great catches where you see guys. <laughs> actually, I'm not sure if you guys saw the one the other night. Johnny John Wells took one at the SCG the other night that he was running full full steam, 30 or 40 meters around the boundary, dive full length to his right, caught the ball, was going to fall over the rope, flicked it back in. Obviously, didn't count as a catch, but you know the the athleticism we're seeing from the modern players as far as the outfield catching is concerned now is unbelievably good. Mm. Um, so I don't look to – No, that's all right. Look, ben, I mean, you've ben seen Sto- a few ben any Stokes. times. Ben, ben Stokes in the World Cup in 2019, I reckon at Edgebaston, and took one on the boundary where yeah. he ran in and then ran back and the ball was going back over his left shoulder and he dived back and behind him with his right hand and took it in his right hand and NASA's commentary on that was um, was pretty cool. That That's probably as good an outfield catch as you can see. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely okay. ridiculous. Terrific. Now, I don't, do you – you may remember last time, and this has obviously been a badge of honour for Eddie and myself. Um, as we wrapped up our chat last time, we um, we basically fulfilled boyhood dreams of taking on, you know, an, an Australian legend and captain in a coin toss, and we beat you. We actually beat you quite quite considerably, I think. Yeah, um, that's right. Well, I couldn't see the coin, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a fair point, um, but <laughs> one that we will not acknowledge. You might edit that out. Um, we uh, tradition stipulates we got to go again. Another coin toss to round this thing out. And we're gentlemen, so we're going to allow you to call it in the air. But just want to make sure that you're willing and able and consenting to another coin toss. Yeah, are we going one, three, five? Best well, it's up. It's up to you. You what? made us. You went five. You, we went five last time on your. That was on your say so. So if you want to go five, yeah, that must again. have been because I, I must have lost the first two. So <laughs> yeah, I, think so. I think. I think you did. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll, we'll see how we go this time. Yeah. You can well, call. Well, let's, so what was it last time? Five. Let's go. Let's go to five again. All right. Perfect. All right, perfect. Happy to do that. All right. Well, this is your call in the air. All right. You can see me. It's a bit of a delay, but gotcha. Heads. Tails. Tails. Pick yeah, that up. All right. It's out. It's it's, it's, <laughs> it's tails. Punch in on that. Yeah, that's a tail. That's All a right. tail. Well, if you boys, if you boys have done your homework, you would have realised I would have called heads every time last time, and you've come up with a, a double, t- <laughs> oh. a double t- <laughs> point. Tails never fails in New South Wales, Ricky. You should know better. All right. All okay. right. Heads. Heads. Heads it is. Uh, heads That's it one is. all. One, one. Look out. Here we go. Here we go. He's coming home. He's coming home. Here we all go. Right. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Heads. Yeah, it's a head. Oh, jeez. It's a head. It's a head. Should have picked best three. Should have picked best three. I'll tell you something really funny. Going back, I'm not sure if we had this, if I told you this story last time as well, but the Indians, when you were over in the subcontinent, the Indians are, are, are so superstitious with anything like this, like a coin toss or, you know, the way that their bats are laying in their bag or how their gloves are drying on the boundary line. But certain Indian captains that you go to toss against, when you got out to toss, they would put the coin on top of their hand and put their other hand over the top of it like that, so you couldn't see what was facing up. Because they have this, they have uh, this theory that whatever's facing up, it's going to come down the opposite. So they don't, they don't let you see what's oh actually really. But so they cover it up, they cover it up with both hands, and then throw it up from there. So, wow. Well, in respect to the Indians, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Let's two one. Right, yeah, two one. Heads. This is for it. This oh. is for it. Oh, he's got it. <laughs> He's got there you it. go. Well done, Rick. Well, it's one all. It's one all. It's yeah, one all. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> one all. It's one all. We'll get to the decider next time. Do, do you know what the most you ever won in a row was? No, nah, no idea. No, nah, I probably lost more in a row than I won in a row. Yeah. Yeah. Was there ever a time where you're like, Jesus Christ, like I need to win a toss here? 
Oh, lots of yeah. Well, every time you went to the subcontinent, every time you went to India or somewhere like that, you you wanted to win the tosses there because you knew that if you were batting last, that it was going to be hard work to win. There's that. There's also other tosses. You go out and you look at the pitch and you hope you don't win the toss because you've got a really you got a really <laughs> big decision to make. Um, with 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 you know when the when the pitch is borderline bat and bowl, bat or bowl, when it's yeah. you know it's a bit moist and overhead conditions in England are sort of coming over, you sort of. You sort of feel like you you should bowl, but in your in your heart you think you probably should bat. They're the ones that you want to lose, and obviously, what happens then? You always win those ones. Yeah, so. that's the way. That's yeah, the way it goes, way. mate. Thank you very much for uh, for your time again. It's always great to chat. Um, Ponting Wines is it pontingwines.com.au? Is that where people can go to yeah, get the? Sure, uh, sure is, mate. That's yep. it. Um, and we've got a we've got a code at the moment. We do. We've got a discount right? code for the punter and the dribbler. It is dribbler. As always, the code is dribbler. Um, I'll look up what the percentage is and I can but put the, that no, in No, that's right. We'll put that in at the end. But pottingwines.com.au. Thank you, Ricky. All the best for the summer, mate. Appreciate your time and we'll talk no again soon. No worries, boys. The only, um, the only thing I've got here, next time we do this, mm. we're doing it later in the afternoon so we actually can have a glass yeah, of wine. Yeah, love no, it. It's a love great it. idea, mate. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Good Thank on you, Ricky. Mate. Thanks, right, mate. Cheers. Thanks, See mate. Cheers. Could you two just not talk anymore?